So we're uh, we're starting up into session eight, and this is uh, this was our our final planned session. We will have the the two, uh, if you want to call them, uh, the bonus episodes uh, following following this in the in the following weeks. But uh, this will finish us out in our uh, in our progression through through the Bible itself, and uh, we'll be talking about uh, the Acts of the Apostles and uh, Paul's letters, Paul's epistles. So again, uh, as we've been uh, running through, let's, uh, let's talk about a few problems that, uh, that we might have uh, with, uh, with this particular time frame in the Bible. Uh, and uh, you recall last, last session, we talked about uh, Luke as a historian and uh, where, where that reputation lies. And there, there's been a lot of criticism of Luke in the past. Uh, and one of the reasons why you can try and criticize Luke is because he gives you a lot to criticize. Uh, Luke, uh, as we mentioned last time, uh, he sets out and tells you he's going to write a history. And so he gives you details. He gives you, he's very much uh, giving, you, giving you details. He's talking a lot about locations, uh, people, and so forth. And so that gives uh, a lot of critical scholars uh, some leeway to say, okay, well, we don't think this detail in Luke is correct, or we don't think we've got this right, or whatever. And we, we you know, the city he mentions, we don't have any record of it, and, and so forth. So, uh, so there's been a lot of that in the past. Uh, and as you might, uh, might expect, uh, some of that has changed uh, in the intervening time frame. Uh, really, uh, we have, uh, William Ramsey, uh, in the, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, was a skeptic who had decided he was going to prove, uh, that Luke was wrong, that, that Luke was a poor historian and, and, and he really was going to challenge the historicity of the book of Acts. And as he got deeper and deeper into the um, investigations, looking at archaeology, looking at various texts uh, from the same time frame, uh, he came to find out that uh, wow, the Luke, Luke got a lot of things right. Uh, and so uh, William Ramsey is probably one of the biggest proponents of Luke the historian. Uh, and just giving you a few of those, uh, well, and, and maybe to, to even uh, go to that now, there's not nearly so much criticism of Luke by, by scholars. That's, that, that ship's kind of sailed, uh, especially in the book of Acts. Uh, there's been so much, um, there's been so much corroboration that's been found. And so we'll, we'll talk just a little bit about that. Uh, as I mentioned before, Luke gives us a lot lot of names and titles throughout uh, throughout the book of Acts, uh, and he gets them all right. Uh, we talked last week about uh, the uh, about the fact that uh, even some Roman historians of say a hundred years later were getting the titles of some of the of some of the Roman officials wrong. They were using the titles from their time instead of the titles that were in use at the, at, at that particular time. And we've seen from the archaeology that uh, you know the uh, the the proconsul versus uh, procurator and 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 so forth with with Pilate. Uh, and and oh, another thing that was pointed out by Ramsey is that uh, not only does does Luke get to get those things right, he also gets the terminology right in terms of Roman uh, government. So, uh, you know, the governor of a senatorial province, a, a, a Roman senatorial province, uh, would be a proconsul, but the governor of an imperial province, one that's administered by the emperor himself, uh, is called a hegemon. And we see those terms used correctly uh, in, uh, in the book of Acts. Uh, we talked a little bit before, he does use the term tetrarch correctly instead of king as regards uh, the, the Herodian family until it changed. Uh, and then you get just a lot of, of personalities. You get uh, Felix, Festus, and Gallio. And uh, we found uh, records of each one of these individuals and uh, what we know of the office they served in uh, lines up exactly with, uh, with the office that Luke says that they were in at the time uh, of his writing. Uh, Luke also shows a, a great knowledge of geography. 
Um, he uh, one of the one of the points that they make is that uh, Lystra and Derby, uh, which are both in Asia Minor, uh, were Lyconian cities, and there were several Roman historians and geographers who uh, who, who put them in the wrong place, but Luke got them in the right place. Uh, Caesarea is listed as a separate city-state. It was an imperial city. It wasn't part of Judea. It was actually basically a city that was owned by the emperor. Uh, so, uh, you know, gets that right. Uh, if, if you read in the book of Acts, uh, there's a lot of sea journeys going there. And Luke gives some very accurate portrayals of travel by ship. Uh, one, of the, one of the points that was, uh, that was brought up is uh, it takes a different amount of time to go east than to go west. You, if, you, if you go to a certain location and then you turn around and come back, it, it doesn't take the same amount of time because the winds at different times of the year are, are going in different directions. So it takes you longer to come back maybe than it does to go or vice versa. And uh, if you read in, in the book of Acts, he actually uh, points that out. Uh, also, um, Luke is noted for giving us a, a nice general picture of the culture. Uh, he talks about Ephesus as being a place with uh, a lot of uh, a lot of magicians and where magic is sort of uh, sort of worshipped. Uh, there's a lot of focus on the Temple of Diana, which was one of the uh, which was one of the wonders of the world. He talks about uh, the Athenians when Paul goes to goes to Athens. He talks about the Athenians and how they just had this insatiable intellectual curiosity. The, uh, I think in, in Acts, it even says they always wanted to hear the new things, the new learning. Uh, and then uh, he uh, describes very, uh, very capably the intolerant crowds in Jerusalem. And, you know, this we're looking at a time frame that's about 20 to 30 years before the uprising of, uh, of the Jews against the Romans that eventually led to the, the destruction of Jerusalem. So, uh, so he's given us a snapshot of, uh, of, of the day and the life uh, that, was, uh, that was being led uh, at that particular time. Now, uh, we talked about ossuaries a little bit last, uh, last session. Uh, the, you know, an ossuary is a bone box uh, well, we have the James ossuary, and, and we want to talk about problems here a little bit. This is an ossuary that caused a great deal of controversy, and, and it still is to a certain extent. So uh, if you'll recall, most of these ossuaries are going to be uh, limestone boxes that uh, you, would, you would lay out uh, a, a deceased individual uh, in a tomb, and their body would eventually decompose, and you would take the, the bones and put them in the box. And you would uh, inscribe on the box the name of who was in the box. And so in 2002, uh, there was a press conference held in Jerusalem that announced that an ossuary had been found uh, that was inscribed James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. So who do we think that might be? Uh, well, obviously, a lot of people thought that I thought that this, you know, this could be James, the brother of, of, of Christ. So uh, so then begins the media frenzy. Uh, people are just going crazy. And uh, the experts will tell you that uh, the ossuary is definitely from that general time frame. It's general. It's it's from that first first century A.D. time frame at the right at the right point. But immediately the, the question was, eh, is this inscription really, really legitimate or not? Did somebody fake this or not? Uh, and so in 2003, the owner of the ossuary, Oded Golan, uh, was basically charged with forgery in an Israeli court. And the trial went on for years. Uh, and you had experts coming in and they were talking about the patina in the in, in the inscription. So basically, if it's old, then, you know, there there's some surface, um, you know, you know, surface aging and everything. And so you've got people looking at this thing with microscopes and looking at, at fungus and all, all sorts of other things. And for every um, for every expert who came along and said it's a fake, you you know, then the defense would call somebody who would say it's legit. And so uh, there was all kinds of contradiction all over the place. 
And so in 2012, uh, Golan was acquitted of forgery, but he was convicted of illegal trading in, in antiquities. Uh, you'll recall, we talked about that uh, uh, several sessions back, that the Israelis are pretty, uh, pretty uptight about, uh, about you selling, uh, selling antiquities. So uh, he, de- he did a little, bit of, a little bit of time for that. In the end, the Israeli judge who presided over the trial, who, funny enough, had a bachelor's degree in archaeology, uh, stated that the acquittal didn't mean that the, pro- that the inscription was authentic. It just meant that the prosecution didn't prove that it was a forgery. So this is still a going concern even today. You've got people who believe it is, and you got people who believe it's not. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult, difficult to say. Uh, you know, in the end, does this, uh, does this increase our faith? Uh, I, I, I don't really know that it does. But uh, it, it definitely is a, a problematic thing because you have, uh, you have a lot of people who want it to be, and then you have a lot of people who don't want it to be. And uh, in both cases, they're, they're willing to maybe push things or, or shade the truth a little bit or, or, or so forth, rather than just kind of letting the chips fall where they may. So uh, this is, again, uh, a, a, bit of a, a bit of a problematic thing. It doesn't really challenge anything, but it, it just... Uh, it just keeps things stirred up, I suppose. And so we'll move to to our synchronisms, uh, our, our little pieces of history that kind of match up or or, uh, or overlap with uh, with the biblical account. Uh, we have the Erastus uh, inscription uh, in Romans sixteen twenty three. Paul talks about an individual named Erastus. Uh, who was listed as the steward or the city treasurer of Corinth. And uh, in Greek, that term is oikonomos, uh, which means director of the household or the overseer of the household. Uh, and so it, it, we, we think it, was, it must have been some kind of a, uh, some kind of maybe a, a, an appointed office or, or whatnot. So, uh, In 1929, uh, an inscription was found in a paved area near the old amphitheater in Corinth. And uh, from the inscription and from some other things around it, they've they've basically agreed that it it comes from about the mid first century AD. So about 50 AD, which is the general time frame that Paul was uh, was operating in the area. Uh, Now, the inscription reads. Erastus, in return for his aedileship paved this at his own expense. So, uh, so in order for us to get a little better feel for that, um, an A-dial, uh, A-E-D-I-L-E, I may be mispronouncing that, but uh, uh, an A-dial was an elected Roman position. And uh, these Roman officials were responsible for kind of maintaining the public buildings and the streets and, and the infrastructure. Uh, it's it's similar to being well I won't say it's similar to being a tax collector but but the Roman uh, the Roman government kind of operated that way you sort of you would sort of bid on a on a position and so uh, you might spend some of your own money to do some of these things but then you would you would have access to the to the government money uh, to do all this stuff as well so uh, we we found several inscriptions at various locations in the Roman world that talk about a dials actually paying for a, a particular um, a particular building or or some sort of thing like that out of their own money, and that's that's one of those unique aspects of of Rome. Uh, if you were wealthy, you were expected to to serve in the in the government um, at no uh, you know at no salary uh, essentially. So uh, that that was kind of the thing. If you had the money, then uh, then you know it was considered your your duty. So obviously Erastus must have been someone who had uh, had a little bit of money. It would appear. Uh, now, as is as is usually the case, uh, scholars argue over whether the position of a dial uh, is equivalent to an oikonomos. Uh, you know, you you know, one's Latin and one's Greek, uh, but you do have to figure that both of them uh, deal with some sort of financial management. So 
uh, you've got uh, an inscription of somebody named Erastus uh, in the right place at about the right time. Uh, it, it, it seems like the, the, the preponderance of evidence would, would say this is probably the guy who, uh, who Paul was talking about. Now we also have the Gallio inscription. Uh, we're going to see a lot of inscriptions now because, you know, the Romans, the Romans just, uh, uh, you know, uh, archaeologists kid around about the fact that if, a, if you've got a, a stone that's standing still very long, the Romans are going to inscribe something on it, uh, usually their name. Uh, so you have the Gallio inscription. If, uh, if you look at Acts chapter 18, uh, when Paul is in Corinth, he is brought before the civilian authorities uh, because he's accused of persuading the people to worship God contrary to the law. That was the, the charge that was made against him uh, to, the civilian, uh, to the civilian authorities. And verse 18 uh, of Acts 18 tells us that, that, that the particular, uh, uh, the particular uh, civilian authority that he comes before uh, was named Gallio. And uh, he was uh, and, and mentions that Gallio was the proconsul of Achaia, which is another name for, for Greece. So here we have the, uh, the inscription uh, between uh, 1905 and 1910, uh, a French excavation team found multiple fragments of a communication to the people of Delphi in Greece. So this, this particular fragment is not in Corinth where, where the, the events occurred. It's actually in Delphi, which is in a, a, a little bit different part of Greece. It's not too terribly far away. Uh, but they found this in the early part of the 1900s. And in 1967, it was finally translated and it identified Lucius Junius Gallio as the proconsul of Achaia. Uh, they have been able to, based on some of the other things in the inscription, because it talks about which year of the emperor it was, uh, they've been able to put this down to about uh, 51 AD. Uh, we know that generally the proconsul position normally had a, about a one-year term uh, on it. Uh, again, in the, um, in the Roman system, uh, you, the, the, the wealthy people in politics would bounce around and go a lot of different places. They would be in the army for a while. They would, they would be serving as, uh, as government officials and so forth. So, uh, so it, it's not uncommon to, to see people bounce around a lot of places all, all over the empire. And another interesting thing is uh, not too terribly long ago, archaeologists also believe that they have found uh, in Corinth what's called the Bema or the judgment seat. And that would have been where Gallio would have been presiding in Corinth uh, and would have been hearing these kind of, uh, uh, would have been hearing these kind of uh, uh, accusations. All right, one more inscription uh, for synchronisms anyway, uh, the Sergius, Sergius Paulus inscription. Uh, now, again, in Acts chapter 13, verses 6 through 14, uh, we see uh, Paul and Barnabas are in, on the island of Cyprus, and they have some trouble with a magician who is named Bar-Jesus. And uh, this guy, Bar-Jesus, was noted as trying to influence the Roman pon uh, proconsul there in Cyprus, whose name was Sergius Paulus. He's trying to... Uh, He's trying to get him to, to convert to, uh, to his particular religion. And in the course of, uh, of the activities there, we find that uh, Paul uh, essentially through the, through the Holy Spirit overpowers him, overpowers Bar-Jesus, and eventually convinces this proconsul Paulus uh, to accept Christ. That's one of the very first high officials we, we hear of uh, who uh, is listed as having accepted Christ. So what is our inscription here? Well, let's talk about Paulus a little bit first. Uh, Lucius, Sergius, uh, Paulus. Uh, there's a bunch of inscriptions. There are, there are several inscriptions, and they're all from the mid-first century AD. So again, the right time. Uh, we have one uh, in Italy that shows him as the curator of the Tiber River. Uh, that's like a commissioner, like a water commissioner. Uh, in, and this would have been in Rome uh, in 47 AD. They've been able to date that based on the year of the emperor. Uh, they have the Saloi 
uh, inscription, which was found on the northern coast of Cyprus, and it was found back in 1877, and it mentions a proconsul named Paulus, and it's been dated to 54 AD. So again, we're in the right time frame, and we're in the right place. Uh, now, the inscription that you see here on the uh, on the slide, uh, this this inscription uh, has the name Sergius Paulus. You can see here you've got Paulus, and then you've got uh, the beginnings of Sergius right here. Uh, this this particular inscription was found in Pisidian Antioch in Turkey, uh, and it is one of of many. There are several inscriptions in this whole area of Turkey that use the Paulus name such that uh, a lot of scholars believe that probably the, the Paulus family estates were probably somewhere in that general general area. Now, uh, this is a point where I'm going to you know, wander, off, uh, wander off the reservation a little bit here, but uh, in Acts 13.9, uh, which is is in this same general time frame of of dealing with Paul Sergius Paulus and everything else. This is the first time that we see the use of the name Paul instead of Saul. Um, and in verse fourteen, it seems that when this happens, that the group was on their way to Antioch in Pisidia, and if that is the location of the Paulus family estate, then maybe there was some closer connection between Paul and, and this proconsul uh, Sergius uh, Paulus. Uh, don't know that. That is purely speculation. But boy, it's a, it's a nice coincidence that, uh, that just makes you kind of wonder uh, at, at some point. Uh, so we'll, let's move from synchronisms uh, into uh, some cultural specificities here. Uh, one, uh, we know that um, that there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of angst about uh, the sacredness of the the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, the historian Josephus describes the second temple uh, and notes that there is a low wall that separates the court of the Gentiles because you could worship at the temple as a Gentile, but you could only go so far. So there's a low wall that separated the court of the Gentiles from the interior areas where only Jews were allowed to worship. And as part of his uh, description, he comments that at regular intervals, there were warnings posted in Greek and Latin that said that no foreigner was permitted to enter the sacred areas. Well, uh, to tie this in also with the Bible, in Acts 21, uh, Paul is threatened by a Jewish crowd because they believe that he has taken a Gentile into the restricted area of the temple. And there's, there's a big riot and everything else going on. Well, all that kind of comes together. Uh, in 1871, uh, a French archaeologist discovered this limestone block, and it was in the area of the temple ruins in, in Jerusalem. It was there very close to the Temple Mount. And uh, the inscription has been translated. This is, uh, this is Greek. Uh, the inscription has been translated as, no foreigner is to enter within the railing and enclosure around the temple. And whoever is caught will be responsible to himself for his subsequent death. So this is, uh, this is about as good a, a corroboration as, as you're going to get uh, in, in this regard. So, uh, and, and funny enough, uh, you know, this one was found in 1871. I think in 1935, they found another one that was fairly similar. Uh, so uh, obviously uh, something that was that was relatively common. And uh, it does really uh, line up very well with uh, with the written accounts that we that we have. Now, sometimes uh, sometimes culture is is uplifting and sometimes it shows a little bit of a uh, a meaner side of society. The Romans were notorious for graffiti. Uh, the excavations in Pompeii uh, particularly comment on, they learn probably in some cases more from the graffiti uh, than they learned from anything else. Uh, it, it's probably the precursor to, uh, to social media. Uh, you know, these people just felt the need to, to, to scribble whatever they were thinking uh, on, on a wall. So we have the Tertullian and Alexamenos uh, graffiti. 
uh, really the graffiti is, is the Alexa Menos. Uh, and the reason it's called that, uh, this is, uh, this is the first known representation of Christ and his crucifixion that we are aware of. Uh, and it is graffiti that is mocking the crucifixion, but it is the earliest, the earliest dated type thing that we have. Uh, talking about Christ and crucifixion. And it's been dated to somewhere around 200 AD. Uh, and what you see there is you see, uh, you see a figure up on a cross. You see the arms outstretched. Uh, now, what you see that, that seems kind of odd is it looks like there's the head of a donkey there. And so uh, you kind of look at it and you say, okay, that's, that's kind of that's odd. Well, the text says Alex, Alexa Menos worships his God. So obviously this graffiti is, is kind of throwing some, throwing some rocks at Alexa Menos. Uh, but, you know, you, you might look at it and say, okay, I don't quite get where, where we're going with this. But uh, in the same general time frame, one of the church father, fathers, Tertullian, uh, comments on the fact that there was a common accusation by the pagans that Christians, quote, worship the head of an ass, unquote. So that saying from Tertullian and then also uh, looking at this graffiti, they kind of line up fairly well. And they also show us that it, at least by 200 AD, it was a fairly common, uh, it was fairly common knowledge because this occurred in Rome. Uh, it was fairly common knowledge that, uh, that, that someone named Jesus Christ had been crucified. Uh, the, the graffiti itself was scratched into the plaster of a wall, and, and it was in a building called the Pedagogium, and it was on the Palatine Hill, Hill in Rome, and it very, very fortunate to, to find it, uh, and it was found in 1856. And so we'll finish up with yet another inscription, the Polytarch inscription. Uh, and uh, this is in Thessalonica. Uh, again, Luke had got all kinds of criticism, you know, before people really started jumping into, into researching and kind of kind of figuring out where he got his stuff. Uh, he was he was roundly criticized. And this was one of those criticisms. It was uh, uh, he was criticized for using the term Polytarch. Uh, when he refers to the leaders of Thessalonica in, uh, in Acts chapter 17 uh, in a couple of different places. Uh, really, at the time frame in the 1800s, the term was just not known to scholars. And they, uh, the classical Greek uses a different, uh, a different term for the, the city officials and so forth. So again, they were, uh, they were throwing some, some rocks at, uh, at Luke the historian. However, uh, we have here uh, an, an, another inscription uh, from uh, Thessalonica, and uh, the inscription came from a stone that was part of the gate, and it, it reads, in the time of the Polytarchs, and you can see here there's a pi, an omicron, a lambda, uh, an epsilon, and, a, and an iota. Uh, the tau, alpha, a rho, and a chi, so polytarch. Um, so essentially, you, you have this, this stone that, that says, okay, obviously that term was in use uh, in, in, in Thessalonica in a time frame. This was another one of those inscriptions that was found in 1856. Uh, must have been a good year for finding inscriptions. Uh, however, since then, there have been at least 20 other uh, inscriptions or, or something that was that was turned up in the archaeology at Thessalonica that also mentioned polytarchs. So it's been pretty consistently shown that that was, while that may not have been a, a term that was in use all over Greece, it was definitely a term that was in use in Thessalonica. So that is what I have for today. Um, our, back to our references. Uh, these references are uh, things we talked about last week as well. 
Uh, but again, can't say if, if you just have interest in the uh, artifacts themselves, uh, the book by Fant and, and Reddish is, is great. It's got great pictures and gives you three or four pages uh, on each one of the artifacts and, and gives you the biblical significance as well. Uh, again, Marshall's book, Luke, Historian and Theologian, it's a little, it's a little dense. Uh, it, it was a bit of a chore to, to wade through. It's, it's got great information, but not, uh, not just a, a, something you'd pick up for, for pleasure reading. And McRae's Archaeology in the New Testament is a, is a nice just general type thing if you want to just kind of thumb through and, and see the various impacts of, uh, of archaeology in the New Testament. So uh, let's 